as we've been going through Hebrews, obviously, slowly, obviously, uh, in a very, very line-by-line line way, the words become very important. And uh, what I love about that is, you know, there's debates about words. Well, it's what I said, I didn't mean it, or people will say words matter. I, I think you agree words matter. You can pull out your tongue and cut somebody apart and destroy them. It'd be, it'd be easier if you punched them in the face and said nothing versus opening your mouth and using words to destroy someone's life. Think of it. Or you can turn around and speak life into someone's existence. And I think in this century or perhaps in this millennia that we're in, we've gotten away from viewing and understanding the power of what we say. According to the book of James, you and I have got the power with our tongue to say things that will incredibly be powerful for the negative or powerful for the positive. Think about it in your own life right now for a second. Don't think too much. But growing up, what did you hear growing up? You know that what you heard growing up had a lot to do with shaping the way that you view the world today and how you grew up hearing what you grew up. For some, maybe for most. We've had to apply the word of God constantly to that battle of what it was that was instilled within us. And uh, I'm, as a pastor, I've heard it all. The things that I have heard, I, 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 I don't know if it's post-traumatic stress syndrome or what, but sometimes the, the thoughts of what have ha what's happened to some of you that you've shared with me stresses me out. And yet you're the one that lived it. And then there's some of you who I know and I rejoice in where we didn't have that growing up. Your life, your dad, your mom, they just built you up. They encouraged you and they gave you opportunity and they put you in impossible situations standing with you and behind you knowing, you know, that you need to be pushed and we're here for you. Versus some who have said, you'll never amount to anything. And so words matter. And when God gives us his word, church, every single word of the Bible needs to be studied and is true. And when you and I come to the Bible, and if we don't get it, or if we don't understand what we're reading, listen, listen. Wait on the Lord regarding that word. I encourage all of you, and we all do this. When you're reading through your Bible, and you come to something that it, you just don't understand what's being said, circle it, mark it down, and ask God to show you the meaning of it, what it's about. And watch what happens as God begins to answer you regarding those things. It's absolutely epic, because his word is alive. And his word is alive because you're alive and you are the church. And he wants to equip you and he wants to strengthen you. And we're going to be talking about that because that's the nature of verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 2. It says there, looking in your Bibles, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. What, what is he saying? In those previous verses, he's announcing that it is God who has spoken by the prophets to the fathers in these, last, in these ancient times, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus Christ. He's telling us that the word of God is uh, the eternal truth, and it is the ultimate judge. It is the factor. It is the standard. That word, notice this. The word of God, the Bible says, became flesh. Thank God that the law did not become flesh. Imagine that. The law was embedded, right, in stone. The Ten Commandments, holy, just, pure, no doubt, perfect. But as I've mentioned before, it never spoke, it never embraced you, it never encouraged you, it's the law. And it has no ears, it has no hands, it says thou shalt not. 
And those are good things, by the way. Those things will keep you alive. Those are the guardrails for living and, and how to live with others. But the word of God became flesh. The Ten Commandments, it's the word of God. But it was to announce the fact that you and I are a lost people and need salvation. Jesus comes along and he is the word of God manifested. And he not only shows us miracles, he not only performed them. The Bible is the documentation source of this in the Gospels. But the fact of the matter is that the word of God reached out and touched lepers. The word of God reached out and as we talked about on Sunday, picked up from the ground, right? A woman who was caught in the act of adultery. It was the word of God that brought food, bread and fish to a lonely crowd. And so as we look at this, I want to set this up for where we're going in the weeks ahead. And I am praying, I am trusting that it has a major effect in your life. So watch this. When it says here in verse 4, God also bearing witness. God is announcing, my word goes forth and my word goes forth with power. Somebody say amen to this. My word goes forth with power. God says, I'm going to make sure you understand that. And it is going to be a witness to you. So when he makes the statement that God also bearing witness, God bringing forth, listen, I love this. God is bringing forth, God has brought forth the evidence of the power of his word. And what is it? It's miraculous powers. It says right here, signs, wonders, with various miracles, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. So the number one thing in our lives today, when we hear about miracles and miraculous powers, when we hear about signs and wonders, we have this temptation to recoil, to step back and wait a minute. And I totally get it. The reason why we are cautious about these kinds of things is because of abuses. Would you agree? Especially those, and I'm not beating you up, it's just true, you can wear it, it's true, it's a reality, this is how we're going to get over it. But on one side, the pendulum swings, and it's the hyper-Pentecostal movement, those groups, where if you don't speak in tongues, you can't be saved. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. That is cranked up by the promoters of that kind of stuff. It's not in the Bible. You just need to know that. Well, if you performed a miracle, if you haven't performed a miracle, then you, you're, you know, doesn't say that either. There's a group, you know, in fact, I grew up in a church uh, where Pastor Chuck Smith used to say, God doesn't matter how high you can jump in your experience. What matters to God is how straight you walk after you land. And that's a good word. So, man, we went to church last night. Oh, man, we were jumping up and down, running around, sweating up a storm. God was in this place. Well, what happened? We ran around, we got sweaty and jumped up and down. And the emotionalism is thrilling. The music is amazing. I'm not knocking it. But that's not the criteria to determine that God was in the place. It's nothing. I guess it's not wrong to go to a, a gathering of believers and, you know, Sweat, I guess. And <laughs> but you cannot assume that it's a work of the Holy Spirit. But I want to be honest and fair. People always try to, by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to get in trouble, which is beautiful about this, because I get labeled on both, both ends. Both sides will label me. Okay? So I guess if both sides attack me, then I guess I'm in somewhere in a good spot. So... I, I, I believe that our God, the creator God of the universe, I believe that he is in experiences. I don't think he's stoic. I think God is in experiences so long as they're biblical and they glorify God. And that's the criteria. I don't believe that the God of the Bible wants you to walk around as some the, the theologian 
that is wrapped in black and stoic, and you look like you've been sucking lemons all day. You say, oh, I don't know. I don't know, pastor. No, listen, the joy of the Lord, the Bible says, is your strength. It says in scripture that you and I should have a song in our hearts. Think about that. There should be a a sanctified Holy Spirit beauty to our lives that causes the world to at least be curious. Especially in these dark times, we should be more beautiful than ever to the world. So some will say, oh, pastor, no, 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 experience, bad. How can that possibly be? Because Daniel encountered God and he had an experience. What about Jeremiah? What about John? What about Paul? It seems to me that everyone who's had some form of an encounter with God, you can even call it a faith crisis. I'm very fond of, 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 of saying faith crisis. I believe that every true believer has to have a faith crisis. Some people believe because their friends believe, their dad believes, their mom believes. I think you need a faith crisis. I think you need to be shaken to the core to find out if what you believe is what you believe because it's been revealed to you by God. Don't believe because somebody says so. You don't really believe. What you want to believe is what scripture declares and you've experienced enough to know, wow, God spoke to me. God is moving. And so I believe that as I'm following God and serving God, that I'm going to experience God. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. Because God relates to me always through his word, but he causes his word in my life to be applied so many times by experience. And I see God move in an experience when, for example, I go to the store or I might be taking up the, the walk, or, or whatever it might be. You find him in those places, and you should be expecting him to move in those places. And so I think that God relates to us, and often with experience. The problem becomes, friends, when the pendulum swings too far, and that's all you're living for is for the experience. And so you wind up being in a church where, oh man, come, come on, we just, you got to come. It's just all signs and wonders. Now that gets to be really, really scary because number one, your experience with God is solely based upon how you felt in the service. And then you know you're in a bad spot when somebody, you, maybe you went to such a service and you're saying things like this in such a service. What did you get out of it? What did you feel? Be careful if you're in a church and people begin sampling each other. What, how did you feel? When, what, what did you get out of it? That's a breeding ground for error, for danger. You should experience God. It will be based on scripture. It will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. It will always be done according to the scripture in order, decently. It's the way God moves. He's a perfect gentleman. But the other pendulum swing is this, that, no, you guys who are looking for experience, mm -mm, no, it's, it's, it's dry, it's boring, following God is, is, is a big yawn, and you just have to endure this until it's all over. Okay, I'm so happy that you are so wrong. The truth of the matter is, if you want to put on your sandals and experience God, as it were, and you walk as it, as it was in the first century era, wouldn't you see God doing things? Let's be honest. You say, well, that's because Jesus was walking around. Excuse me. Guess what Jesus said? He said in John chapter 14 and John 16, I got to go. I'm going back to the Father. And it's really good for you that I leave. Because if I don't leave, the Holy Spirit will not come. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine the disciples thinking, this is awesome. 
He's risen from the dead. He's back. This is great. Are you going to restore the kingdom now? And Jesus says, I'm leaving now. <laughs> what do you mean you're leaving? You just busted the grave? We're, we're on a roll, Jesus. <laughs> and he could have said, you're correct. We're on a roll. It's just starting to roll. And here's how it happens. I leave. I go back to heaven. And I'm going to speak to my father. And he's going to send you the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, you are going to have power. And you're going to take this message and the power of the gospel. And you're going to take it to the ends of the earth. You're going to start in Jerusalem. You're going to advance into, over to Judea and Samaria. And you've got to see these guys. Samaria? That far, huh? <laughs> and then he goes, and to the ends of the earth. And here's what's cool about this. That's exactly what happened. And here you are tonight. Because of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, being fulfilled. And all of that has been by the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's in power. So as we look at this, I want you to be asking yourself over the course of the next few weeks, if I'm a believer, I'm not saying like if, like I'm questioning your salvation. I'm asking you to ask yourself this. So if or since I'm a believer, how is this verse being activated in my life as a believer? And I'm praying that all of us have some form of an encounter with God whereby we are transformed into what he wants us to do next in our lives. Because here's the good news. Not one of us in this room have arrived at being the person that God created us to be. We're closer, but we've not arrived. Would you agree? Yes. Okay, please. Because if you think you've arrived, we're all going to go home with you tonight <laughs> to see just how much you've arrived. I would assume that you're out on a midweek like this because you want more of God. Yes, that's what I thought. So when he says that this witness is established, that God has established a witness that he provides, he does so with signs and with wonders. Mark this down, first things first. Signs and wonders must be biblically qualified. Why do we say that? Because Jesus and the apostles warned that in the last days, the great deception would take place by false prophets and false teachers who will bring to you, what? False signs and wonders. So much so, Jesus said, they're going to do false prophets and false teachers that they're going to do signs and wonders so amazing that if it were possible, even the very elect of God would be deceived. That is, that is amazing. Deception. Think of it. We got to, you just got to, you got to think about that. You got to get your armor on. You got to clear your eyes and just so get ready because this is just and I'm I'm look I am going to imagine something right now that is in no way shape or form even close to the magnitude of deception that Jesus warned us about cuz there's if it's he said it's so bad that if the very elect could be deceived then I can't even imagine it so you just imagine this that your child is sick your child's got covid wait kids don't get covid do they Okay, your kid fell off their bike. They're, you know, they're messed up. Your kid's dying. And, and the, the paramedics are there, and you, it, it's over. I mean, you're watching your kid expire. And somebody comes up and says, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. I'll just touch him. And this person touches your kid, and your kid stops bleeding, your kid stops spasming and convulsing and your kid gets calm, his eyes open up and he stands up and your kid, the, the big bump or the crack of the head goes away and the kid stands up and he's completely fine. 
What would you do? What would you do? Come on, think, just play with me for a second. What would you do if that happened? What, happened if, what happens if you have cancer tonight and somebody in the parking lot says, hey, listen, um, let, me, let me pray for you and you're going to be healed. So here we go. And they pray for you and you go to the doctor tomorrow and they say, your cancer is completely gone. You're going to want to find out, who's this person? What power did this? And so when such things are done, people ask questions. Of course we do. Isn't that what we see in the Bible? Who healed you? We demand an answer. Uh, I don't know. I was blind, and now I can see. Uh, His name was Jesus, and I'm, I'm fine now. Someone's going to come on the scene, and Jesus said there's going to be many of them, where they're going to do miracles, and they're going to say, I, done, I, I, I performed this miracle, I did this by the power of, by the power of, something. Oh yeah, they'll probably say God. Remember that? I hope this church is smart enough to know that if you believe in God, that means nothing. Because we live in a culture where we have to ask the question, exactly, Marcel, God who? And so we need to dig down because, well, wait a minute, I don't care what, I don't care what that guy believes in, I don't care what he preaches. My son was dying and now he's perfectly fine and I'm going to follow that guy. Jesus said, that's the days that are coming. Why? Why? falsehood. You have to have true for true to be counterfeited. And Satan knows that bad representations of truth deceive people, trick people. People are suckers for the experience that in some way, shape, or form brings an immediate answer to the tension, to the pressure. What if you've been praying for six years that your marriage would get better, and it's not, but you go see some, some person with a crystal ball and a turban on their head, and they throw some dust in the air and wave a chicken foot, <laughs> and, and you go home and your husband has baked a cake for you, and he massages your feet. You, you would say, whoa, I'm going to go back to that shaman right now. Maybe I can pick up some extra bucks. <laughs> if you don't have a biblical grounding and a biblical foundation, you will be swept away. Yet at the same time, the Bible speaks about signs and wonders. And the Bible speaks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the workings of miracles, And we relegate them down to things like this in the 21st century. Because, you know, we're so refined. We're so highly educated that, what do you mean by this? These things cannot be explained. That's right. That's why they're called miracles. A miracle, listen, is done, and I have to, look, let's just talk about it in the God context first. According to the Bible, a miracle is when God, the God of the Bible who has the ability to alter his creation. A miracle is what violates natural law. It'd be a miracle. We'd all love this. I had a dream like this just the other night. I just, now I'm just remembering it. It's wonderful. <laughs> Where I climbed up on my house. I got to the top of the roof. And I don't know if you have dreams like this. I, have the, I love these dreams. And I, I don't know why it's my t-shirt. I take my t-shirt off, hold it over my head, and I step off the roof and just soar <laughs> all over the neighborhood, <laughs> skimming over trees. It's so cool. Okay? But I don't know why I just shared that with you, by the way. My mind just <laughs> went somewhere. And so I honestly forgot what I was talking about on that. But 
when, when there's these things where science is defied, it freaks us out, and yet God defies science. He made science. He's the engineer of science. He's the inventor of it. He can alter it. But according to the Bible, the spirit realm, powers of darkness can do the same. And we don't like that. But what happened when Moses encountered the magicians of Pharaoh? Those demonically, satanically powered spiritual people, spiritists, performed what looked like to everybody standing miracles. But they were of demonic origin. Moral of the message, you always want to judge the message that is connected to the miracle against the Bible. Did you get that, everybody? This could save your life. Take the message that is in association with the miracle or the sign or the wonder and apply it. Make sure it's Bible. And I mean Bible, but you're going to need to know your Bible. And so when he says here that there's gifts of the Holy Spirit, notice the word gifts here. It's plural, not gift. We're not talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We're talking about the gifts of the Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. By the way, the grammar demands this, that God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is who, the Holy Spirit, who, according to his own will. This is amazing. It's not the will of the Son and it's not the will of the Father. It's the will of the Holy Spirit Get your finger ready. I need to get, you, get your index finger up and ready. Come on, you can do this. Where, where, where is the, where's the Holy Spirit in your life? Where does this go? Go ahead and move it, and let's just go like this. Okay, it's kind of cute. I don't know if it's this. Is it here? Is it, it doesn't matter. My body, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you ask the little ones across the way, they're going to go like this. You're going to ask them, where's the Holy Spirit? And they're going to go, some of the class will go like this, and some of the class will go like this. You can even ask them about Jesus. Ask them about, where's Jesus? Some of the kids will go like this, and some, most of the kids, or some of the kids will go like this. Same with you. Same with us. Both are accurate, by the way. Both are accurate, so think about this. Here, the Bible says in Hebrews 2, 4, that the Holy Spirit, who, by the way, is inside of you, is the one who distributes gifts for signs and wonders and miraculous works, why? To establish the witness of God, okay? And he does that through the believer. So in many dark places of the world where there's no Bibles, there are missionary accounts. By the way, again, the Muslim world reports this often where Muslims who don't have a Bible, they've never heard about the real Jesus, Jesus is reaching them by miraculous signs. He said, oh, I didn't, that didn't happen to me. That's because you have a Bible. <laughs> Read it. It's not that he's not going to do a, a miracle because you have a Bible. The truth has been provided to you. Read it. And I got to tell you, and please, if you disagree, don't tell me this. Be, don't disagree with me. Just disagree with me because I love it. I don't need to see the blind eyes open. If that's what God wants, I will pray, and I'll pray in faith, believe me. When I pray for people, I expect something to happen right on the here and now, and sometimes it does, okay? But here's the deal. I don't need to see it because I've put myself out there. It's nothing noble. I've just put myself out there because, and this is not sad. It's a good thing. I have nothing else to live for. I mean that in a good way. I have a beautiful family. I've got grandkids. Don't get me wrong. I have you, I mean, there's a lot in my life. But the beautiful thing is, I don't have to see anything like that because when you put yourself out there, God will use you. Yes. Yes. It's easy for you to say, you're the one standing up there. <laughs> this has not always been. And I was asked last night on a TV program, did you always want to be a pastor? The answer was no. <laughs> if you knew me, go ask Lisa and my kids. I did everything to avoid it. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. And I asked the home group that was growing. Some of them are sitting over there right now tonight. I don't want anything to do with this thing. 
It was God's work. Well, the thing is, put yourself out there. Well, what do I do? That's the beautiful question. That's up to him to determine because you know what? You're going to find out next few weeks on Wednesday nights. He has gifted every true believer with at least one gift. Many of you have multiple gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's required. It's a must. If you are in the church of the living God, he's given you a gift that is not a talent, so I can play the piano. Beautiful. That's not a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is something that is not physically native to you. The Holy Spirit will do it. He'll get all the glory. You get all the blessings. You freak out because, whoa, can you believe this just happened? And you can't act like that in public. You have to act like you do. Uh, pastors are such liars. We, we teach the word and God does a miracle and heals this marriage and the things that we hear are amazing. And then we act like, oh, yes, of course. Inside we're going, God, you're amazing. It's so true. I'm just confessing that for every pastor in the universe. We should, when, when you say, oh my goodness, we came to the Bible study and my, I had to drag my wife in. She was like, her heels were dug in, her claws were on the car. She wouldn't come in and she came, and she got saved. My, she got saved. And then, and come on. Pastor goes, well, praise the Lord, brother. <laughs> The pastor is going, I can't believe that happened. <laughs> Why? Because we're seeing miracles. Those are miracles. Jesus said that when I leave and I send the Holy Spirit, he's going to come and he's going to do works through you that are greater than the works that I've done. Jesus said it. Wait a minute. Don't you think raising somebody from the dead is pretty great? According to God, a life transformed is greater. And that's what we all get to do. So I was going to go down the list of those gifts. We don't have the time now, tonight, to do that. I want you to, but I want you to get excited. Especially those of you who are like, oh, Christianity is so boring. I mean, I believe in Jesus, but it's just so boring. Okay, I'm especially praying that God would just run you over with a steamroller. And, and get a hold of you, and you get to start living life once that happens for him. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button, tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're going to continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us. No pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.